Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. I am sitting out here on my back porch. It is a very warm day and it's also smoky because there's a wildfire nearby so probably won't be out here long. But today I'm going to talk about my third favorite book which I mentioned in my one of my other videos, The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. James Fenimore Cooper was an early American novelist he, I believe his first novel was published in 1821. It was called The Pioneers. And it was it was actually what became part of the same series. Um, but it was the first one, which is not the first in chronological order of the story. Um, the Pioneers was based on his hometown in New York and his experiences growing up there. Um, it was kind of a story that address the conflict of urbanization with American frontier culture. So there's some conflict about property rights and hunting rights and things like that that he addressed in that book. Um, other books in this series include The Deerslayer, which is about the same character that is in each book, which is Natty Bumpo, a frontier hunter, scout. Um, so the Deer Slayer, it's also the subtitle is The First Warpath, so it's basically his first adventure. Another one is The Pathfinder, um, which it's about him guiding another party of travelers in the Great Lakes region, and it contains Natty's romance, which is unsuccessful, and um, also, there seems like there's less adventures in that one, too, so I'm not remembering it quite as well as the others. Um, interestingly, um, the real-life explorer John Charles Fremont was nicknamed the Pathfinder um, based off of this book, so it's historically important for that reason. Um, the Prairie is another one in the series, which is when he goes west, and it is my least favorite of the series because you can tell that James Fenimore Cooper did not know as much about the West and the Western Indian tribes as he knew about the East, the New York um, tribes and culture that he, the other books are set in. So, The Prairie is still an enjoyable read, but not definitely not as convincing as the other books. So, The Last of the Mohicans is kind of taking place in the middle of the chronological story. And it is about Natty Bumpo in this um, novel. He's known as Hawkeye. So he goes by various um, names, different names in the different books based on the Indian tradition of calling people um, certain names based on events in their life or some quality they possess. So in, in, this, in this novel, he is known as Hawkeye. And... He is um, scouting for the British, British slash American slash Native American armies in the French and Indian War. The French and Indian War took place, I believe, in 1757, if I am recalling that date correctly. Um, and it was fought against the French. So at the time, the French. Um, I'll say owned, um, occupied, possessed um, the land around the Great Lakes, which the American and British were trying to claim from the French. So the French and Indian War is actually a pretty essential war in American history, even though it's frequently forgotten because like, we weren't in the United States of America yet at that time. But it was actually really essential because, um, for one thing, it strengthened um, the relationship between the Americans and the Native Americans, which was essential during the War of Independence against Britain, um, whatever that is, 20 years later. And it also provided the military training for a lot of the Americans who fought in the Revolutionary War, including George Washington and some other of the major Revolutionary War generals. So. The Last of the Mohicans is set during that war, the French and Indian War, and it's really interesting because James Fenimore Cooper actually put a great deal of research into the um, 
the Native American culture and customs and beliefs from a book written by a Moravian um, missionary to the Indians. So the Ma Moravians were a German Protestant denomination. Um, I believe they might have been part of the German Pietist movement, but I'm not certain on that fact right now. So they they were significant missionaries to the Indians, the Native Americans in the early in the early um settlement of the country. And so his knowledge and his portrayal of Indian culture and customs is accurate actually pretty accurate and very detailed, which is one of the aspects that I think makes this book really, really interesting, and it really draws you in, and it's really fascinating, and that's, yeah, as a writer myself, I really appreciate how much work that must have taken for him to put into all that research and making sure that he portrayed them in a relatively um, realistic and accurate fashion, so that, I think that's really cool. The movie made off of The Last of the Mohicans is not faithful to the book, and it's really unfortunate because in um, making the romantic connection be between Hawkeye and Korra, which is not in the novel, they took out a significant discussion and approach to interracial relations that the novel includes. Uncas is supposed to be in love with Cora, the older sister, and the really essential aspect of this relationship is that Cora is only half white and she is half African American. Um, her her parents was was the father, the um, who was in the British Army, and her mother was a West Indies slave. So she is half white, half black. And so she is partially already an outcast from white society. And it is really... Cooper added an additional level of meaning into this idea of the last of the Mohicans, which is Uncas, because Uncas sacrifices his life for Cora. So he's he's giving up the Indian line and allowing the tribe to die out, but not in favor of the advancement of white society and white settlement. He is sacrificing his racial lineage for someone who is already racially impure it's a misfit in proper white society, I guess. So, the, the idea of The Last of the Mohicans has an extra layer in that, that it's very interesting to wonder what kind of message Cooper was hoping to portray in that. And it's also just addressing the entire concept of different civilizations interacting with one another and um, choosing the civilized life over the adventurous life of the unsettled frontier, I guess. In the end, every character, except Hawkeye, um, chooses to accept the advancement of settlement and civilization and live within it rather than reject it, but it is not an easy choice for all of them, and some, like Ancus, lose his life in making that choice. Um, the book also includes a lot of discussion about um, like racial equality in eternity, so unlike um, some in his time, Cooper believed that all humans were destined for the same eternal salvation, basically, and would share 
in heaven, whatever concept that they use to describe that, the happy hunting grounds for the Native Americans or the Christian heaven. Um, he believed that we were all going to the same place and that we would all live together there in peace and equality and harmony, which was also a very advanced and, and open-minded approach for the time. And also the characters address many questions of morality and justice and um, faced with hard choices that they weigh in relation to all those um, virtues and morals. It's very, it's very really actually a very deep and thought provoking book. It's not just like a wild frontier adventure like a Western nowadays might be. It also addresses the conflict between the different Native American tribes, which is also interesting. And again, information that he largely drew from the Moravian missionaries account. So this segment, they are um, the party of travelers, which include Hawkeye, um, Chingagook, and Ancus, his son, Hayward um, from the British army, and the two daughters of the British general that he is conveying to the general, Cora and Alice. So they are hiding in a rock in the middle of the river, which was actually a real place and became one of the first tourist destinations in America based off of this book. Um, so they are hiding there and they are being attacked by a party of Huron Indians, which were their enemies. And this segment includes some of the moral dilemmas that they're faced with and their reasoning in facing these um, issues. At length, emboldened by the long and patient watchfulness of his enemies, the Huron attempted a better and more fatal aim. The quick eyes of the Mohicans caught the dark line of his lower limbs, incautiously exposed through the thin foliage a few inches from the trunk of the tree. Their rifles made a common report when, sinking on his wounded limb, part of the body of the savage came into view. Swift as thought, Hawkeye seized the advantage and discharged his fatal weapon into the top of the oak. The leaves were unusually agitated, the dangerous rifle fell from its commanding elevation, and after a few moments of vain struggling, the form of the savage was seen swinging in the wind, while he still grasped a ragged and naked branch of the tree with hands clenched in desperation. Give him, in pity, give him the contents of another rifle, cried Duncan, which is Hayward. Turning away his eyes in horror from the spectacle of a fellow creature in such awful jeopardy. Not a colonel, exclaimed the obdurate Hawkeye. His death is certain, and we have no powder to spare, for Indian fights sometimes last for days, as their scalps are ours, and God who made us has put into our natures the craving to keep the skin on the head. Against the stern and unyielding morality, supported as it was by such visible policy, there was no appeal. From that moment the yells in the forest once more ceased, the fire was suffered to decline, and all eyes, those of friends as well as enemies, became fixed on the hopeless condition of the wretch who was dangling between heaven and earth. The body yielded to the currents of air, and though no murmur or groan escaped the victim, there were instants when he grimly faced his foes and the anguish of cold despair might be traced to the intervening distance, in possession of his swarthy lineaments. Three several times the scout raised his peace in mercy, and as often, prudence getting the better of his intention, it was again silently lowered. At length, one hand of the Huron lost its hold and dropped exhausted to his side. A desperate and fruitless struggle to recover the branch succeeded, and then the savage was seen for a fleeting instant, grasping wildly at the empty air. Lightning is not quicker than was the flame from the rifle of Hawkeye. The limbs of the victim trembled and contracted. The head fell to the bosom, and the body parted the foaming waters like lead when the element closed above it in its ceaseless velocity, and every vestige of the unhappy Huron was lost forever. No shout of triumph succeeded this important advantage, but even the Mohicans gazed at each other in silent horror. A single yell burst from the woods, and all was again still. Hawkeye, who alone appeared to reason on the occasion, shook his head at his own momentary weakness, even uttering his self-disapprobation aloud. "'Twas the last charge in my horn and the last bullet in my pouch, and twas the act of a boy,' he said. What mattered whether he struck the rock living or dead? The feeling would soon be over. Uncas, lad, go down to the canoe and bring up the big horn. 
That is all the powder we have left, and we shall knead it to the last grain. In this section, the English fort William Henry, which was an actual fort in operation during the French and Indian War, and um, he includes in this book as well a actual event that um, occurred. It was called the Massacre of William Henry, and it was a very unfortunate event in which um, the British Army refused to reinforce the fort, and the besieged British and Americans um, within the fort were forced to surrender and then as after they had surrendered and as they were being moved out of the area um, the French Native American allies ambushed and massacred the majority of the former inhabitants of the fort and the French army stood by and did not stop them and nobody quite knows why um, that event occurred and why why the British didn't reinforce the fort or help out their besieged um, countrymen there and also why the French allowed the massacre to occur um, without attempting to stop it. So this section is about the aftermath of that massacre. When Uncas, who moved in front, had reached the center of the plain, he raised a cry that drew his companions in a body to the spot. The young warrior had halted over a group of females who lay in a cluster, a confused mass of dead. Notwithstanding the revolting horror of the exhibition, Monroe and Hayward fl flew towards the festering heap, endeavoring, with a love that no unseemliness could extinguish, to discover whether any vestiges of those they sought were to be seen among the tattered and many-colored garments. The father and the lover found instant relief in the search, though each was condemned again to experience the misery of an uncertainty that was hardly less insupportable than the most revolting truth. They were standing, silent and thoughtful, around the melancholy pile. When the scout approached, eyeing the sad spectacle with an angry countenance, the sturdy woodsman, for the first time since his entering the plain, spoke intelligibly and aloud. I have been on many a shocking field and have followed the trail of blood for weary miles, he said. But never have I found the hand of the devil so plain as it is here to be seen. Revenge is an Indian feeling, and all who know me know that there is no cross in my veins. But this much will I say, here in the face of heaven, and with the power of the Lord so manifest in this howling wilderness, that should these Frenchers ever trust themselves again within the range of this ragged bullet, there is one rifle shall play its part so long as flint will fire or powder burn. I leave the tomahawk and knife to such as have a natural gift to use them. What say you, Chingagook, he added, in Delaware? Shall the Hurons boast to their women when the deep snows come? A dream of resentment flashed across the dark lineaments of the Mohican chief. He loosened his knife in his sheath, and then turning calmly from the sight, his countenance settled into repose as deep as if he never knew the, the instigation of passion. Mount calm, Mount calm, continued the deeply resentful and less self-restrained scout. They say a time must come when all the deeds done in the flesh will be seen at a single look, and, by, and that by eyes cleared from mortal infirmities. Woe betide the wretch who was born to behold this plain, with the judgment hanging about his soul. Ha! As I am a man of white blood, yonder lies a redskin. Without the hair of his head where nature wrote it up. Look to him, Delaware. It may be one of your missing people, and he should have burial like a stout warrior. I see it in your eye, Sagamore. A Huron pays for this, afore the fall winds have blown away the scent of the blood. Chingagook approached the mutilated form, and turning it over, he found the distinguishing marks of one of those six allied tribes, or nations, as they are called, who, while they fought in the English ranks, were so deadly hostile to his own people. Spurning the loathsome object with his foot, he turned from it with the same indifference. He would have quitted a brute carcass. The scout comprehended the action and very deliberately pursued his own way, continuing, however, his denunciations against the French commander in the same resentful strain. Nothing but vast wisdom and unlimited power should dare to sweep men off in multitudes, he added, for it is only the one who can know the necessity of the judgment, and what is there short of the other that can replace the creatures of the Lord? I hold it a sin to kill the second buck before the first is eaten, unless a march in the front or an ambush be contemplated. It is a different matter with a few warriors in open and rugged fight, 
for tis their gift to die with the rifle or tomahawk in hand, according as their natures may happen to be white or red. Uncas, come this way, lad, and let the ravens settle upon the mingo. I know from often seeing it that they have a craving for the flesh of an Anita. It is as well to let the bird follow the gift of its natural appetite. Ho! Huh, exclaimed the young Mohican, rising on the extremities of his feet, and gazing intently in his front, frightening the raven to some other prey by the sound and the action. What is it, boy? whispered the scout, lowering his tall form into a crouching attitude, like a panther about to take his leap. God send it be a tardy Frencher skulking for plunder. I do believe Kildare would take an uncommon rain would take an uncommon range today. Uncas, without making any reply, bounded away from the spot. In the next instant he was tearing from a bush and waving in triumph a fragment of the green riding veil of Cora. The movement, the exhibition, and the cry, which again burst from the lips of the young Mohican, instantly drew the whole party about him. My child, said Monroe, speaking quick and wildly, give me my child. Uncas will try, was the short and touching answer. The simple but meaning assurance was lost on the father, who seized the piece of gauze and crushed it in his hand while his eyes roamed fearfully among the bushes, as if he equally dreaded and hoped for the secret secrets they might reveal. This part is from the end of the book, The Funeral for Uncas and Cora. The sun found the Lenape on the succeeding day, a nation of mourners. The sounds of the battle were over and they had fed fat their ancient grudge, and had avenged their recent quarrel with the Mengue, but the destruction, by the destruction of a whole community. The black and murky atmosphere that floated around the spot where the Hurons had encamped, sufficiently announced of itself the fate of that wandering tribe, while hundreds of ravens that struggled above the bleak summits of the mountains, or swept in noisy flocks across the wide range of the woods, furnished a frightful direction to the scene of the combat. In short, any eye at all practiced in the signs of the frontier warfare might easily have traced all those unerring evidences of the ruthless results which attended an Indian vengeance. Still, the sun rose in the Lenape, a nation of mourners. No shouts of success, no songs of triumph were heard. In rejoicings for their victory, the latest straggler had returned from his fell employment, only to strip himself of the terrific emblems of his bloody calling and to join in the lamentations of his countrymen as a stricken people. Pride and exultation were supplanted by humility, and the fiercest of human passions was already succeeded by the most profound and unequivocal demonstrations of grief. The lodges were deserted, but a broad belt of earnest faces encircled a spot in their vicinity, whither everything possessing life had repaired, and where all were now collected in deep and awful silence. The beings of every rank and age of both sexes and of all pursuits had united to form this breathing wall of bodies. They were influenced by a single emotion. Each eye was riveted on the center of that ring, which contained the objects of so much and of so common an interest. Six Delaware girls with their long, dark, flowing tresses falling loosely across their bosoms stood apart and only gave proofs of their existence as they occasionally strewed sweet-scented herbs and forest flowers on a litter of fragrant plants that, under a pall of Indian robes, supported all that now remained of the ardent, high-souled, and generous Cora. Her form was concealed in many wrappers of the same simple manufacture, and her face was shut forever from the gaze of men. At her feet was seated the desolate Monroe. His aged head was bowed nearly to the earth, and compelled submission to the stroke of providence. But a hidden anguish struggled about his furrowed brow. That was only partially concealed by the careless locks of grey that had fallen neglected on his temples. Gamut stood by his side, his meek head bare to the rays of the sun, while his eyes, wandering and concerned, seemed to be equally divided between that little volume which contained, which contained so many quaint but holy maxims, and the being in whose behalf his soul yearned to administer consolation. Hayward was also nigh, supporting himself against a tree and endeavoring to keep down those sudden risings of sorrow that it required his utmost manhood to subdue. But sad, and melanco but sad and melancholy as this group may easily be imagined, it was far less touching than another that occupied the opposite space of the same area. Seated as in life with his form and limbs arranged in grave and decent composure, Uncas appeared arrayed, arrayed in the most gorgeous ornaments that the wealth of the tribe could furnish. Rich plumes nodded above his head, wampum, gorgets, bracelets, and medals adorned his person in profusion, though his dull eye and vacant lineaments too strongly contradicted the idle tale of pride they would convey. 
Directly in front of the corpse, Chingagok was placed, without arms, paint, or ornament of any sort, except the bright blue blazonry of his race, that was indelibly impressed on his naked bosom, during the long period that the tribe had been thus collected. The Mohican warrior had kept a steady, anxious look on the cold and senseless, senseless countenance of his son. So riveted and intense had been that gaze, and so changeless his attitude, that a stranger might not have told the living from the dead, but for the occasional gleamings of a troubled spirit that shot athwart the dark visage of one, and the death-like calm that had forever settled on the lineaments of the other. A girl, selected for the task by her rank and qualifications, commenced in modest allusions to the qualities of the deceased warrior, embellishing her expressions with those oriental images that the Indians have probably brought with them from the extremes of the other continents, and which form of themselves a link to connect the ancient histories of the two worlds. She called him the panther of his tribe, and described him as one whose moccasin left no trail on the dews, whose bound was like the leap of a young fawn, whose eye was brighter than the star in the dark night, and whose voice in battle was loud as the thunder of the Manitou. She reminded him of the mother who bore him, and dwelt forcibly on the happiness she must feel in possessing such a son. She bade him tell her, when they met in the world of spirits, that the Delaware girls had shed tears above the grave of her child, and had called her blessed. Then they who succeeded, changing their tones in a milder and still more tender strain, alluded with the delicacy and sensitiveness of women to the stranger maiden who had left the upper earth at a time so near his own departure as to render the will of the great spirit too manifest to be disregarded. They admonished him to be kind to her, and to have consideration for her ignorance of those arts which were so necessary to the comfort of a warrior like himself. They dwelt upon her matchless beauty and of her noble resolution, without the taint of envy, and as angels may be thought to delight in a superior excellence, adding that these endowments should prove more than equivalent for any little imperfections in her education. After which others again in due succession spoke to the maiden herself in a low, soft language of tenderness and love. They exhorted her to be of cheerful mind and to fear nothing for her future welfare. A hunter would be her companion, who knew how to provide for her smallest wants, and a warrior was at her side who was able to protect her against every danger. They promised that her path should be pleasant and her burden light. They cautioned her against unavailing regrets for the friends of her youth, and the scenes where her father had dwelt, assuring her that the blessed hunting grounds of the Lenape contained vales as pleasant, streams as pure, and flowers as sweet as the heaven of the pale faces. They advised her to be attentive to the wants of her companion, and never to forget the distinction which the Manitou had so wisely established between them. Then, in a wild burst of their chant, they sang with united song voices the temper of the Mohican's mind. They pronounced him noble, manly, and generous, all that became a warrior, and all that a maid might love. Clothing their ideas in the most remote and subtle images, they betrayed that, in the short period of their intercourse, they had discovered, with the intuitive perception of their sex, the true disposition of his inclinations. The Delaware girls had found no favor in his eyes. He was of a race that had once been lords on the shores of the salt lake, and his wishes had led him back to a people who dwelt about the graves of his fathers. Why should not such a predilection be encouraged? That she was of a blood pure and richer than the rest of her nation, any eye might have seen. That she was equal to the dangers and daring of a life in the woods, her conduct had proved. And now, they added, the wise one of the earth had transplanted her to a place where she would find congenial spirits, and might be forever happy. As you can see in that segment, it is, again, very interesting to note that he is praising Cora in such terms and praising her above Alice. And um, I think it is very beautiful, the ideas of harmony and the same heaven that is portrayed in that piece. Alas, the Mohicans... Today's can be frequently written off as part of the noble savage genre, um, praising the Native American culture as, you know, more, more pure and innocent and godlike than you know, um, is realistic. But I think that's a pretty unjust accusation on the book, really, because there's as many terrible Native American characters as there are noble and generous and moral Native American characters, and the same goes for the European characters, like there's good ones and 
there's bad ones and there's it's it's a very nuanced story and contains a lot of different characteristics of in anyone of any race portrayed in it so I think that's an oversimplification for categorizing the book myself and I find it a extremely thought-provoking and deep work that warrants reading many times to actually um, draw out the fullness of all the themes that are portrayed within it. So thank you for watching and I will see you in my next video.